our final final briefing will be on the Water Power Research and Development Act, uh, advised by Professor Cass, uh, and the uh, the briefer will be Anna Nicole, Nicolova. And uh, if we're ready, uh, let's get started. Good morning, classmates, faculty, and guests. I'm Anna Nikolova, and today I will be presenting the final briefing for the Water Power Advancement Technology and Training Program. I would like to thank my teammates for this task, Jessica Kenny and Katherine Lynn, our managers, Rachel Goodgall and Drew Poling, and our faculty advisor, Lloyd Cass, for their help in preparing this presentation. Through today's briefing, you will understand the rationale and implementation plan for the Water Power Advancement Technology and Training Program. First, I will present a case study for water power implementation and describe the different types of available technology. Second, I will outline their associated challenges and opportunities. Finally, I will present the design and implementation plan for the program. It starts with a vision, a vision for a better world for our kids. One where we're no longer addicted to fossil fuels, where we have transitioned in a fair way to a green economy that works for everyone. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio is one of the many leaders prioritizing the energy transition by investing in hydropower. With the closure of the nuclear plant at Indian Point next year, New York City's dependence on fossil fuels for electricity is projected to increase. This reliance on oil, gas, and coal produces greenhouse gas emissions and leads to global warming. Related pollution and extreme climate events have outsized impacts on communities of color and low-income communities in New York and beyond. To avoid increasing fossil fuel use, the state has approved the $3 billion Champlain Hudson Power Express or CHIPI transmission line. CHIPI is designed to connect the booming hydropower generation industry in Quebec, Canada to New York City through an underground cable installation. You can see the route highlighted in red on the top left. Once completed, this project has the potential to supply 17% of the city's daily power demand and will create 2,000 New York jobs. Its budget also includes $117 million for an environmental trust fund. Chippy shows that hydropower can provide large scale clean energy and that importing power from Canada may be a missed opportunity to develop American energy resources. With proper investment, locally generated water power can spur the transition to a renewable energy system. So what is water power? The two types are hydropower and marine energy. While hydropower is well established in the US, marine energy technology is largely in the research, development and demonstration phase. In 2019, hydropower made up just under 7% of total US electricity generation. However, this percentage varies regionally, and some states use hydro for up to 27% of their energy needs. There are three main types of hydropower technology, impoundment, diversion, and pump storage. Electricity is produced when energy from free falling water spins a turbine that drives a generator. Then the generator converts the motion to electrical energy for use in the mainstream grid. The photo on the left is of a diversion dam in Oregon. In contrast, marine energy technology is undeveloped at a commercial scale. Examples of marine energy are the kinetic energy from waves and tides and the energy produced by differences in salinity and temperature gradients in the ocean. Early stage open water devices exist that can convert this energy into electricity but are not yet connected to the mainstream grid. In the right-hand photo, you can see the testing of the wave energy converter device by the US Navy in Hawaii. 
If developed at scale, wave energy along the US coast has the potential to supply 64% of the country's electricity needs. Despite their great promise, there are multiple challenges preventing hydropower and marine energy from advancing. By 2020, 70% of all dams in the US will be more than 50 years old, reaching the end of their useful life. As such, they are at risk of collapse and flooding. In the photo on the left, you can see the collapsed Samford Dam in Michigan that forced the evacuation of 10,000 people in May of this year. Another challenge associated with hydropower is the slow permitting time for new projects, upgrades, and retrofits. These approvals can currently take from five to 10 years. As a new technology, marine energy faces a different set of challenges. Oh. As a new technology, marine energy faces a different set of challenges to achieving utility scale. To reach the next phase of development, it will need a massive injection of capital from the public and private sectors. There are also several issues shared by both sectors. Water power is experiencing a shortage of skilled workers at every level. With the anticipated growth of this sector, these workforce needs will only increase. Additionally, Black, Indigenous, and people of color individuals, institutions, and communities are underrepresented in research and development, specifically in who receives funding and who benefits from the applied technology. The Water Power Advancement Technology and Training Program, abbreviated WATT, was created to address these challenges. The program is authorized under the Water Power Research and Development Act of 2020 to promote the research, development, demonstration, and commercial application of water power. To achieve this objective, the bill appropriates about $150 million per year for the Department of Energy's Water Power Technologies Office and for grants to National Marine Renewable Energy Centers. The Watt program represents a subset of all the Act's goals and will deploy a portion of these funds. The design of the Watt program is divided into two sections, technology advancement and training. Within technology advancement, the first objective is to improve the reliability and resiliency of existing hydropower plants. This will be accomplished by speeding up the permitting process for approval of upgrades and retrofits for dams. Second, the Watt program aims to make energy, marine energy technology cheaper and more accessible. This will be accomplished by establishing a new dedicated university research center and by supporting existing centers. In the training section, the third objective is to grow the water power workforce through increased outreach and education activities. This will be accomplished by sponsoring and promoting internships and fellowships at all levels of the sector. The final objective is to increase equity and inclusion in research, development, demonstration, and application of water power. To reach this goal, the Water Power Technologies Office will redesign its grant making process to award more contracts to underrepresented groups. The Watt program's ambitious objectives will require hiring additional talent. Our proposed staffing plan involves creating four new positions within the Department of Energy's Water Power Technologies Office. First, a liaison to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which is the government entity responsible for issuing hydropower permits. The liaison will work in consultation with the Commission's office and relay their progress of reducing bottlenecks in the permitting process. Second, an administrator to manage the new National Marine Renewable Energy Center contract. Next, a workforce development program manager to launch the proposed fellowship and internship programs. 
And finally, an equity and inclusion contractor to develop processes for increasing diversity and in staff and funding allocation. You may be asking yourself, what will all these programs cost? The Water Power Research and Development Act allocates 74% of the total funding to marine energy and 26% to hydropower. To prioritize marine energy commercialization in our program, we have budgeted $40 million for developing this new technology. This money will be largely spent on grants to university research centers. The remaining funds are devoted to setting up staff and organizational capacity in the spaces of workforce development, hydropower permitting, and equity and inclusion. The total estimated expense for the Watt program for the first year of enactment is $41 million. Some illustrative indicators for the successful execution of the Watt program's objectives include for hydropower permitting time, a reduction by 50% from the 2020 baseline. For marine energy commercialization, the procurement of a contract to launch a university research center on the Atlantic coast. For workforce development, an increase in the number of applications to federal water power job openings by 50% from the 2020 baseline. For increased diversity and inclusion in the sector, a target to award 25% of all grants and contracts to entities serving Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities. According to the International Panel on Climate Change, the world has 30 years to reach net zero carbon emissions and prevent catastrophic climate change. 182 countries have committed to achieving this goal by signing the Paris Agreement in 2015. As the second largest consumer of fossil fuels, the United States is uniquely positioned to reduce global emissions. Through a large scale investment in water power technology and training, we can channel our capital, knowledge and talent towards achieving a just energy transition. I would like to thank the entire team that contributed to this workshop over the past two semesters, and especially our advisors, Professor Howard Apson and Professor Lloyd Cass, for their expertise and guidance. Thank you for your attention. We will now take your comments and questions. Thank you, Anna. Very nice. Excellent job. Uh, Stephanie, do we have any raised hands among the group? I see Ariella has raised her hand. Yes. Ariella, you should be able to unmute now. Hey, Anna. Uh, thank you for that presentation. That was really interesting. Uh, so you briefly mentioned retrofitting, and I was just wondering if you had any idea how that can, how much that can actually increase hydropower capacity. Yes, um, there have been some assessments made by the Department of Energy um, that estimate that if we were to retrofit dams that are in disrepair right now, so there are a lot of dams that um, are just not producing any electric power right now because they have been neglected. If we were to go in and retrofit those dams, they have the capacity to, produ to produce um, 12 gigawatts of electric power. So for reference, the Hoover Dam has a capacity of two gigawatts. So it would be like, yeah, creating six Hoover Dams. Okay, uh, Karen, uh, your question. Stephanie, did you unmute her? Okay. Yes, hi, Anna. Thanks so much for that presentation. I thought it was really fascinating. I have a actually two-part question. One's related to Ariella's question. Um, first, so I was, I was wondering also about when you retrofit the, hy the hydropower dams, did your group look at all at minimizing ecological impacts when upgrading those installations? And my second unrelated question, which um, is just about the marine energy that you were describing, I thought was so intriguing. And I'm wondering what's the likelihood that this technology will be promoted and funded? 
Yeah, absolutely. To answer your first question, um, with retrofitting, the great thing is that um, these dams already exist. So if you are not building a new dam, so you are not actually disrupting the environment um, in that way because the infrastructure is already there. Um, and the other great thing is that in the past 50 years, uh, technology has vastly improved. So these older dams would now be retrofitted with technology that is um, much more environmentally friendly and better tested. Um, so that's on the hydropower question. On the marine energy question, um, you know, that that's a really, that's a really interesting, um, it's, it's an interesting question. You know, it all depends on political will and how much funding we're willing to invest um, in promoting this new technology. Okay, uh, Jenny, I think you had a question. Yeah, great job, Anna. Um, I was just wondering, I, I know there's a lot of different kinds of water power projects um, that might be involved in this legislation. Um, are there any more, like, can you elaborate on examples of potential projects, like where they would be located if that's something that has already been looked into? I know like there's some Canadian hydropower project that a lot of New York state wants to get in on. Um, yeah, Jenny, can you specify um, what kind oh, of- what kind of hydro? Um, well, I guess maybe like the small, um, smaller hydropower projects um, that are using freshwater sources, not, I guess, marine. Yeah. Sure. Um, so there are a lot of different projects in development. We actually focused more on um, marine energy. So as, as you saw in our presentation, the great majority of our funding is going towards the development of new marine energy technology. Um, so I'm not quite as familiar with um, proposed new Okay. And are there are uh, there specific marine projects like in the works yet or no? There are um, there are many um, that are currently in their pilot phase. Um, there is one in Hawaii that uh, they're actually testing um, connecting into the mainstream grid. Uh, so that's happening on the U.S. Navy base in Hawaii. Um, and then there is a new National Marine Energy Renewable Center that will be um, that will be launched uh, soon. So that is a very real new thing that's happening. <laughs> and in addition to being a part of our proposed program, um, there, there is that investment being made in new research. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. I thought I saw one in room 407 before. Is that still there? Well, if, if not, um, Stephanie, are there any other questions? Jenny, your hand still raised. Do you have another one? Oh, there's just went down. Okay. All right. Well, thank you again for an excellent set of presentations. And uh, thank you Anna, for a terrific presentation.